Hello, my name's Jacqueline Dunkley Bent, and I'm the first chief midwife for the International Confederation of Midwives, the ICM. I started my journey some three decades ago and in a place called Nottingham in the middle of England. And I became a nurse. And then after a good 13 months of nursing, uh, trained to be a midwife in London. My career has been varied to date. I started out in clinical practice, loved teaching students, student midwives, student nurses, medical students, and very quickly then progressed to become a lecturer in a university, progressed to senior lecturer, curriculum leader, head of school, etc. I moved on and continued in clinical practice, but became a consultant midwife in public health. And soon then took on leadership and managerial responsibilities as a director of midwifery, director of uh, head of nursing, uh, head of women's services, then became a professor of midwifery in a university, always maintaining clinical practice and did so many different roles and eventually became the chief midwifery officer for the NHS in England. I served in that role for four years before taking up the position as ICM's first chief midwife in 2023. Women from black and ethnic minority backgrounds remain, I'm sad to say, remain four times more likely to die and women from Asian and ethnic backgrounds are twice as likely to die compared to white women. That's a really stark statistic. And be behind data, there is the human experience. Data obscures the human experience. And one preventable death is one too many. And those statistics we need to hear, understand, and then act. Women living in, in the most deprived areas continue to have the highest maternal mortality rates compared to those living in the least deprived areas. So in answer to your question, what are the factors contributing wealth Socioeconomic advantage is one such factor. So I would say the social determinants uh, very much uh, influence uh, health during pregnancy and indeed impact on the outcome of uh, a childbirth experience and, of course, the um, how the child survives and thrives. So social determinants, of course, this includes income, access to education, race and ethnicity, which we're talking about today, and also uh, the other population challenges. There's harmful gender norms that seek to continue to um, eat away at equality. Uh, there are many inequalities in relation to prioritize, low prioritization of the rights of women and girls, including their right to safe, quality and affordable reproductive health services. So, I mean, I, I could go on, but they're some of the key items. First of all, we need to listen. So uh, prevention and the factors that uh, create this disparity, first of all, need to be understood. So the health system needs to understand what it's trying to change and work toward having the right formula for changing. And when you're looking at the right formula, you must engage with people who, whose health is in this situation, whose health is unequal. So engage with black and brown women and ask them, understand, first of all. Then once you've understood, then you can start and work toward addressing the systemic issues. And first of all, health professionals need to listen.
there needs to be um, an understanding of the failures, some of the challenges that have created the failures in healthcare provision, because uh, this is not about women and their families uh, not engaging. This is about the health system not finding a way to provide high quality care to all women, regardless of their ethnicity, color of their skin, and socioeconomic status. So some of the failures that health systems can work toward addressing so that we can have a leveling up of equality in health outcomes is really focusing on why some women receive poor quality care and why some women don't. Why some women are disrespected and why some women aren't. Why there is mistreatment and abuse in some parts of our system. Why we have insufficient numbers of healthcare professionals and what this means to quality care provision. And why we also uh, are supporting uh, our health professionals, midwives, to work in a system where they are not, where they don't have the enabling environment to assist them to work efficiently and effectively. Absolutely. So, so I think, you know, there is something about believing the data, believing the data that you receive, that you see. Let's not turn the page to another page. Let's understand, let's know, believe the data and be responsive. So respond to what one is seeing. Focus on the real issues, uh, like, for example, um, a culture within a maternity unit or a healthcare setting. What is the culture? You'll only know the culture if you feel it, if you are an exec that will engage in the life of those who are providing care, watching, feeling, seeing. So let's have a look at the culture. Is it a just culture? Is it a culture of fear? Is it a culture of mutual respect? Is it a culture where staff feel invested in? Invest in staff equally. Let's not have this inequality where black and brown staff aren't invested in. So invest in staff equally so that all, all have an opportunity to access continuing professional development. Um, really, really important. So value staff by supporting them to do their jobs well. And that would include fair pay, uh, resources, resources to work efficiently and effectively address staffing challenges, for example, and hold people to account, hold people to account for racism, racist comments, discrimination, and listen, I would say really listen to those people who are raising concerns, those people who choose to whistleblow. Let's not vilify them, let's listen to what they have to say. When they raise concerns, if they've heard uh, um, uh, conversations or um, opinions about racism or um, homophobia or or things that are unpalatable, it's really, really important that when they raise the concern, they are listened to. And then, of course, there needs to be action that follows. Respond to staff concerns is really, really key. And let their voices be heard. I do think that uh, maybe not the policy makers, although they should be integral to policy, but health system leaders must invest in staff. Staff need to feel and be valued, respected and invested in. And that it shouldn't be based on their socioeconomic status or the colour of their skin. Equitable healthcare systems starts with those who are providing the care. There have been many, but I will say there is so much more to do. I contributed, for example, to the NHS England Equity and Equality Guidance for Local Maternity Systems. 
that guidance is alive today. I hope that it's progressing well. I continue, and I'm proud to say that I continue to co-chair the maternal and neonatal health working group for the Race and Health Observatory and procured last year the most recent study that uh, reviewed the neonatal assessment and practice in Black and Asian and minority ethnic newborns, exploring, for example, the APGAR score and the detection of cyanosis and jaundice. I co-chair the uh, task force to the level up maternity care and um, tackle disparities. So that was a task force that I co-chaired with uh, Minister Caulfield. And the aim of that was to really look at the disparities in healthcare provision and uh, outcomes and experiences. And, and the task force that I co-chaired with Minister Caulfield, it aimed to explore inequalities in maternity care and to identify how the government could improve outcomes for women from ethnic minority communities. Um, I also um, have supported uh, charities, including very fond of five times more likely a charity in the UK that is dedicated to supporting mothers uh, with its campaign. It, it focuses very much on uh, black women to make them more informed about their choices and advocates for um, uh, black women through their pre pregnancies or rather encouraging and supporting black women to advocate for themselves throughout their pregnancies and after childbirth. So that's just a few, just a few examples of how I have and continue to be in this space. Least of all, I haven't mentioned mentoring and supporting uh, black and brown uh, midwives and nurses to this day. My, my call to action for every midwife and health professional that is listening to this narrative right now, that this is our time. This is your time to make a fundamental difference uh, to uh, the midwifery profession and to the care that you are providing as a midwife. This is your time. So let this time count because what you do will ripple through generations. Every contact you make counts and will ripple through generations. So I would say, be your best, do your best, and always do what's right. <laughs>